Scala, Groovy, Clojure, JRuby, and the list goes on. 200 languages. Uh, Clojure. Clojure is the Lisp form in, on, on, on JVM. So Clojure, don't confuse Clojure with Clojure. They're different. Clojure is a language which is a Lisp implementation on the JVM. So you could do Lisp on JVM using Clojure. F sharp is on the CLR. It's extremely mature. Absolutely. It's very mature. I would say, this is just a view, of my view of the world, is just like how C sharp is marginally better than Java, F sharp seems to be marginally better than Scala. It's pretty nice features. Does Clojure, Clojure have all these features? Yes, because it's a Lisp implementation. Each one of them. Mm -hmm. That's right. So Scala is hybrid. Yes. That's they're right. Erlang, for example. Pure functional. You cannot have mutability at all, period. Yeah. Cannot. You have to. Well, it's easy, too, because you can do a grep on var, and immediately you know what that was. Yeah. So I'm trying to not go too much into the language detail here. I'm trying to stay with the functional thing. But then we can go into If you ask questions, I'll dig deeper into it. Mm -hmm. Question? No? OK. OK. Yeah, there are, there, there, are, there are four different ways to write programs. Structured, or procedural, right? Object-oriented, functional, logic. Things like prolog. So, you know, procedural we have used quite a bit. OOP, we have used it for the past 14, 15 years. Functional has been around for 50 years. We are just getting excited about it. When we are, when we are done with it, we need something else to get excited. That will be logic, right? So a few years from now, we'll talk about that. So, yes, yes. So why is uh, Multi-core pr processors. Oh, multi yes. So well, we've got to find some reason. Well, that's, we'll blame it on that, right? Yeah. It's, it's one of the reasons is the multi-core, which certainly is a, is a compelling reason, right? Because your programs are broken, as simple as that. So that's a very compelling reason. But then once there's a momentum and people start moving towards it, there are other reasons we can find out. Oh, it's more expressive, it's concise, it's less code to write, and all these other advantages kind of pile up. It is a paradigm shift, but that's what we did uh, uh, with, uh, with C++ too, right? But here's the deal. It is a huge paradigm shift when it comes to uh, going from bicycling to uh, you know, automobile. Then we have airplanes. Then we have rockets. It's a huge paradigm shift. There is a risk, but there is a bigger growth. And that is the way it is going to be. We, we can, that's a human evolution, right? We never just stick with what we have done, because once we have attained that kind of productivity, we tend to improve the next. And, and there, there's always going to be that case. And especially in a field like our field, it is extremely important to do this because we've been doing this only for about 40, 50 years. So we cannot, we are not in a place where we say we are done. We are in a, we, this is like, if you think about the human history, we have lived for billions, millions of years. Who knows how long we have lived? But what the deal is, though, we have practiced medicine for centuries and centuries. And we have practiced medicine. We, have, we know medicine and a lot of consequences of that fairly well. We know germ theory. We know we've got to wash our hands properly. We know how to really prevent med, you know, infection. But still, there are things we have to contend with. But that's a very mature field. Construction, this building doesn't fall down, at least while we're sitting here. That's, again, maturity, right? We are not anywhere close to it. Hmm. No, it's not really. No, it's not. I mean, it's not that the, it was, it suddenly became complex in 84 when this was invented in 67. There was a huge amount of resistance for people to move forward. That is what our field is. Whenever we read computer programming, the main thing that we look into the books or whatever we do, it's directly mapping to the design and everything is 
It, it, that's, that's a fallacy, by the way. That's not true. <laughs> these, these book authors don't have a clue what they're writing. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, it's not the real world. It's your, it's your abstraction of the real world. It's just another way of expressing things, that's all. You don't need everything. I mean, that's, the, that's a flaw in Java, right? How do you write a simplest program in Java? Public class. Why do I need a public class? Is everything a class in the world? No. Why can't I just have a two-line script that says hello? Or even a one-line script that says hello? But why should it be complex? Simple things can solve complex problems, right? You don't have to make things complex and suffer. It's a, it's a very different view of the world. I think I ignored somebody's question here. It is intuitive. In, you're, you're, too, you're, you're a kid. So it's intuitive for you. Yeah. You talk to the guys who have been programming for 35 years, it's not intuitive. They kicked, they screamed, they begged to leave, be left alone. It is not intuitive. It is intuitive because you're a kid. There is this, this I, I don't remember who said this, uh, but it's a very interesting thing. He said, 14 years, and 14 years are younger, everything you see in this world is the way the world is. You don't think about it. Have you ever t sat one day at your house and said, wow, electricity? <laughs> Have you done that? Yeah, right? No, because it's taken, except when the power goes out, right? But you don't sit there and look at the bulb and say, there was a time in this world when we didn't have electricity. Imagine the guy, the first guy who had light bulb working in his house. You don't go out and dance on the streets like, we got power, right? Well, that's taken for granted most of the time, depending on where you are, but most of the time it is. So 14 years, everything in front of you is the way life is. You go to my kids and you tell them, I want this, oh, Google daddy. Internet was something you, I saw come before my life. There was a day there was no internet. And one day there is internet. Yeah, it's like, wow, it's a paradigm shift. And the kids are like, so what? Right? <laughs> my seven-year-old boy, other day says, what is a whiteout? We were in the store. He says, what's a whiteout? I said, oh, a whiteout. That's for using a typewriter. He stares at me. Excuse me? I said, it's for a typewriter. What's a typewriter? I said, well, OK, typewriter is a machine. You type on it, and then it literally prints on a piece of paper. And because it prints on a piece of paper, you make mistakes. So you would back, and then you white out, and then you type on it. And he says, why would you do that? <laughs> we are computers. Why would you do something silly like that? I said, you know what? It's time to go home. I'm not even going to try to explain, right? The minute you hit 35, 14 to 35, you are willing to accept. You know what? This is strange, but this internet thing, but I can cope up. I'll learn. I will learn to use the browser, right? 35 and over, you're like, Phew. The, the, if, you, if you really you know, view this, the concepts will come, hit the forehead, and bounce, right? I won't take it anymore. The other day I was in the store. There was this grandmother. She wants an iPod. So she buys an iPod. And the guy says, ma'am, do you need help with it? And, and I love her for this. She says, no, 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 no. I've got my grandson. He will take care of everything, and I'll use it. Why a very wise lady, right? So that's why it's intuitive because you're a kid. And, me, and say that in a good way, right? Because you are just introduced to this, and in your life, in programming is 14 years. And you're like, ah, this is intuitive. The guys who have been programming for 30 years, they're in a state of shock because they cannot accept it. Same thing will happen to you, by the way. When the new paradigm comes in, the next guy to you will be saying it's intuitive, and you're like, what did you eat for lunch, right? That doesn't look like intuitive to me. Very good question, by the way, right? Excellent. So let's proceed further. What I want to do here, I want to talk to you about um, tail recursion, right? So let's go try this. What I want to do here, hey, where did I lose that? Okay. Tail recursion, let's talk about that. So I'll create a different example here. Tail recursion. So um, let's write both ways so we can see it. So what I want to do here is write a regular recur recursion. So define regular. And
and uh, number is integer. And what I'm going to do here is simply call a regular n minus 1 plus 1. Is it table recursion? No, because of the plus, right? Because you're going to do some operation when you're done. Um, this I'm going to do is greater if n is not greater than 1, throw new runtime exception. All right. So let's go ahead and call regular. Try regular with the 5. Uh, catch exception. This is Scala. I can't remember that. So uh, case is exception. And let's just print the call stack. So I'm just going to print the call stack here, right? That's all I'm doing. So getting the exception and printing it. Uh, this is a recurring call. So I'm going to say, there we go. So we So what I want to show you here is, notice how many times it's called regular. One, two, three, four, five. Make sense? It called five times because it's a recursive call, correct? All right. Go back to it. But you don't see that in tail. If you noticed, in the tail, there is no call to tail. See that? There's no invoke. It's a pure function with a loop. Is it specific to the Java implementation? No, it's specific to Scala. <coughs> Java doesn't have tail recursion. Okay. Scala has. Groovy doesn't. Closure has. So functional languages are trying to provide this. But regular languages don't provide this. Eventually, the Java language will have tail recursion. That's being debated, proposed right now. What about F-sharp? Uh, F-sharp has it. Absolutely, yes. So we saw tail recursion at work. So do you believe it now? Yes, it's not just the code, but you can see that actually in action, we can see that happening. Uh, well, you could write it in other languages, which are functional too. And to a certain extent, you can write it in Groovy also, but to a limited extent. So it depends on the language capability that you're using. It Groovy doesn't. So tail recursion is not a requirement in functional. Functional languages tend to provide tail recursion. Right? We've got to separate the concepts. Because recursion is so powerful, these languages said, let's make it efficient by providing the recursive tail recursion. Then you got best of both worlds, expressiveness and performance. That, that's why. Is there a reason why people don't provide it in normal languages like C++ or Java? Because uh, those languages were built with a different set of objectives. It's, it's a language uh, design uh, capability, right? A language doesn't provide everything. It's already complex. And the language designers never thought of these things as important things to provide at that time. So that's mainly the reason. <clears throat> y yes, yes, but it's easy to say than, be, than do it. Because a language design is extremely difficult. You can't just go in and throw a concept. There are a lot of things that won't allow it to happen. And even if you allow it to happen, performance may not be good. So there's too many things that limits it. That's why they don't do it so quickly, because it's so hard. JIT will inline it, not the compiler. JIT. So, so let, me, let me explain what I'm saying. When you do a... Invoke virtual, that's a call to a function. You have a bytecode now. Bytecode you got from compiling Java or Scala or Groovy doesn't matter, right? So when you have this bytecode, the JIT compiler will compile the bytecode down in the virtual machine to internal structures, internal statement. When it performs that compilation, this is called JIT compilation, the JIT compiler will look at this invoke virtual and say, 
need to call this function, and it would just inline the call. In the case of recursion, it cannot. But in the case of tail recursion, that's not a problem. Because it became a loop in the first place, there's no recursive call. Yeah, re re that's why. That's where the complexity comes in. A regular recursion cannot be inlined. Uh, Scala and? Groovy. No, Groovy is not functional. So they, well, okay, I use the word dialect, but don't use that word as a dialect. That's not the r right definition. I, I, it easy, it's easy to convince myself in my head if I think them as dialects, because you could just program the same things using these different languages. There are 200 dialects. There are 200 languages on the JVM. Mm -hmm. Yes? It's dynamic because you don't specify the type, right? You don't have to specify what type it is. That's why it's a dynamic language. All right, ready? Next exercise, write a program. By the way, this has to be functional. No assignments. You cannot change variables. Or you can write both ways. Write it in both flavors. A program that doubles the values in a list of numbers. You got a list of numbers. I want a double. So you have a list as 4, 5, 7, 8. You want to get the values as 8, 14, and so on. So double each of the element. Hmm? And print it out. But that's OK. If you cannot print it, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's OK. That, that's fine, too. <laughs> Pair up, pair up with the person next to you and work on it. It's fun to pair up. Done? Anybody? Cool. One. Uh, like a recursion, you're saying? Maybe. So you don't want us to use the recursion? Uh, yeah, you could, you could. There's multiple different, there's no one way to do it. Um, hash map, what would you do with the hash map? Array is okay, but what, what, about, what would you do with the hash map? There's only, there's only an array of values, right? There's no key at all involved. Or, or a array list. Int? Yeah, integer. That's fine. Integer is fine. Ints? Yeah. Sure. Oh, you want a hint? I was hitting as int. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's like int. That's like, sure, int is fine. It's like hint. OK, hint. Um, OK, here's a hint. External iterators versus internal iterators. I was like, that was not any help. <laughs> <laughs> yes, done? All right, two people, three. Uh, all right, so let's give it a try. Uh, we're going to double the values. Let's do uh, uh, imperative first. Then we will write it functional. How about that? So. Um, This is exercise what number? Four, thank you. Um, so let's do it imperative first. So let's start with the list we want. So list is that's my list. And I want to, I've declared it as a val. Val means you cannot modify it, that reference. List itself in Scala are immutable. You cannot change them. So define 
double imperative, and I'm going to send him the list, which is a list of integer, right? So we got the double function written here. So what do you think I should do here? You want to do a for each? Well, before that, you need a double, right? So var doubled equals list, right? You need an empty list to begin with, right? So that is going to be a list of integer. So we got an empty list to begin with. So then what am I going to do? I'm going to return the doubled when I'm done. So for element in list. And I can simply say doubled equals doubled. And I want to append it to this list. And that's an append symbol in uh, Scala. And what I want to append is what? List of e times 2, right? So I'm asking him to double the values. Let's see, line number, oh, I forgot to put the list here. That's where I, you saw me mix groovy syntax with Scala right there. My mind is kind of wired that way there. Uh, expected but found that, line number three. OK, define a double imperative. I've got a list, which is a list of integer. There we go. All right. So that is imperative style. And we printed it out. You want you don't want the for loop you're saying? Um, that's a good idea too. That's because you know what? I should move this down to avoid that kind of mess. There we go. So, good point. That's imperative style, right? But what I want to do is a functional style. So let's write functional. And functional style is going to be a bit of a cheat. So doubled functional list is going to take an integer. And what am I going to do here? I'm going to say list dot map. So map is a function on the list. What map does is Map accepts a function as a parameter. Not an object, but a function. What's that function? That's a function in that little curly bracket. It's an anonymous function, right? And what does that function do? Whatever it does, doesn't matter. But what map will do is, whatever that function returns, it'll collect it. And then it'll return to you. So what should I do in this function? Just stay with this for a minute. Once we get this working, we'll talk about this. So print line doubled functional, double functional. Let's make this double functional. So double functional, and I'm going to send the list. So the result should be the same in both cases. Hmm? Sure. Look at this for a second. What is a function for most of us? A function has a name. A function has a parameter list. A function has a return type. And a function has a body. Name, parameter, return type, body. Of those four things, what's important? The body is important. Here's the body. Right there, right? Let's highlight it. So the body of this function is this. So that's one down, three more to go, right? The parameter list. Right there is the parameter list, E. Normally, what do we have with the parameter list? The type. And Scala says, I can infer the type. I can figure it out. OK, please do. I don't have to tell you what the type is. 
So two, two done. Body is done. Parameter uh, uh, list is done. Scala says, I can figure out the return type. I can infer that too. You don't have to tell me that. And the last thing is the name. It says, who cares what the name is? It's anonymous. So notice how this just became very concise. So what is happening in this code? What's happening in this code is, map is a function which accepts a function. And that function multiplies the value given to it. Map calls that function for each and every element in the list. And whatever that function returns, it collects it. And then when it's done with all the elements, it gives you that. That's why you got the entire list being sent to you over here. And it printed that list. The list is an object. Map is functional. Now you have an interplay of both here. Scala is a functional hybrid object oriented language. If you want pure functional, then you would say list dot map and send two parameters. One is the function and the other is the list itself. We, we, they, what, say what? Simply say map. No, you will say list dot map. Tell me why. Why? <laughs> Tell me why. Anybody? Why should I collect it? Why should I collect it? Avoid is good. Avoid what? Avoid what? There were two cars heading on the street, blindly driving. Avoid collision. When you have global names, you collide. Then you can never have two maps. Bingo. Bingo. I, didn't, I never said it's an object. Give me back my candies. <laughs> that's why you say list. Uh, that's why you didn't get it. Listen. So listen dot, list dot map is, is, a, is, a, is a module, is a packaging. It doesn't have to be an object. Fair enough? All right. That's why. It's, it's good, good to ask these questions, right? It doesn't have to be an object. A part of the effect of objects is namespacing, right? That's why. So, good questions. All right. <laughs> there we go. Um, OK, so we finished writing that. So we wrote it in imperative style, and also we wrote it in functional style. Good enough? Can there be a performance problem here? Because we call this as method every time. Yeah, it could be a performance problem. It may run faster. <laughs> it could be. It depends on what you're trying to do. I will never look at a performance problem as a first thing. The reason is simply this. Let's talk about that because I want to set that answer away for the rest of the day. We, I don't want you to consider that at all. I'll give you two examples for that. The first example is when you are thinking about performance, a lot of times we don't care about the absolute speed. You come to me and say, I want a car that can drive 100 miles an hour. And I'm saying, where are, you going, where are you going to drive? Within the city streets of Bangalore. Why? Because there's no way you're going to do that, right? The day that you think you did, that was a dream, right? So no point in having such a speed car, right? In a very similar way, just an absolute performance is not important. I'll give you one example for this first. I came across this a couple of weeks ago, two weeks ago, or last week. There was a guy who had written an application. He knows Java. And he looks at this application. He thinks this will take several months for him to write it. Several months to write this application, right? But he goes off and writes this in Groovy. In a matter of weeks, he is done. Then he runs through, and it's not performing. It's slow. Well, not comparatively slow. He didn't write it in Java. But it's slow. It's not enough for him. So what does he do? So this is his Groovy code. He runs Profiler. And immediately he finds there is one function which really is slowing down, not the other functions, right? And that one function was doing fairly extensive math operations. 
He leaves all the code in Groovy, takes that one function, rewrites it in Java, puts the job class in the class path, and Groovy can compile and mix with Java, runs the application, performance done. Couple of weeks and one day later, it's done, rather than being months away to get done. That is smart, right? So what you do with performance is you attack where the performance problem is. If you say the performance is important and stop, then you, you're, you're behind, right? The other story is, this is even interesting, there was an application which was doing some kind of analysis. I will be very vague about it. I won't give you details. It was doing some kind of analysis. So people will come to the website, enter some data, it will do analysis, and it will tell them something that they should know. So they went into production. And as soon as they went into production, their sale did not pick up at all. People come to use the site, and they don't come back. So their marketing went out and did research. And they, what they found out was, the people who came to the site for analysis enter the information, click a button, and it gave the data right away, and they thought, this cannot be useful, because it doesn't take time to think. <laughs> and once they knew this, I'm not kidding, the, they called the programmer, and he added a thread.sleep. <laughs> and their sale went up. Because now they are, wow, this analysis has got to be good, because it's taking time to analyze. So that's, again, uh, you know, we've got to be careful with some of these things, because we, it's, it's pretty misleading. So that's my answer about performance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, you want only one allowed. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 no. This is important. It is type inference. You are specified the type once, and it figures it out. Notice this very carefully. You get, in, in Java, you type. In Scala, it's strongly typed, so you type less. So notice here. Let's start with where all we get the type. All the way up here. Notice, oh, here. You said val list equals list 4723. We already know that 4 is an int. 723 is an int, or int. So Scala said, oh, these all are all integers. So as a result, LST is a list of integers. It inferred the information for you. It could be long only if you said an L. So you could have written it as list int, but that's redundant. It, doesn't, it says, that's not needed. You already told me once, I can find out from that. That's called type inference, right? Now, you know what LST is. If you look over here, if I said LST.map and put a function, Scala says, aha, you are calling the map on the list of integer, and wherever map was defined in the library, they already said the type of the parameter should be the type of the element of the list. So as a result, I already know what the type is, so it completely inferred the type. Okay, good question. In the case of Scala, you will get an error. Because Scala says, you must tell me what the type of the parameters are. Not here, over here, by the way. So Scala will require you to do that. F sharp does not. F sharp says, I will go seven more steps for you and find out what the type is. So F sharp has a lot more deeper type inference than Scala does. Good questions, very good questions. Excellent. So we finished this exercise, didn't we? Yes? Next exercise for you. Write a program that will find a total of a list of numbers. By the way, is it boring or okay? Fine? Exercises are okay? I'll let you work also. You had a question, yes. Okay? If you, if you have defined what a double is for your own type, no, no, no. Let's say I'm 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it'll, it will. It, it'll only infer to the least common denominator based on, then polymorphism kicks in, right? So that's the benefit of polymorphism, right? Hmm, same way, like in Java. You say, you know, you say, when you write it, it is virtual by default. And then when you override it, you say override. So the object concept is similar. There are some variations, but that's, that's, that's not related to functional. So what are we doing here? Write a program that'll, that'll find the total of a list of numbers, both imperative and functional. Done? Correct. Everything at compile time. If you look at the Java view minus C, you will see the type information there. So if I write something like uh, list A, B, C, or... As a string? No, I mean uh, variable. Uh, whatever the variable A, B, and C types are, so that will decide that. Uh, from that it will infer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Is there a concept of typecasting? Yes, there is. You could do typecasting, but that will be very minimum and rare. There's a very little need for it. With the inference and polymorphism, you don't have much. In fact, here's what I like about Scala. The typecasting syntax is so horrible that you would not use it. Yeah. I like features like that, where they make it really ugly, you won't use it. Yes, please. Oh, you, you do, you do. You do have a concept of object, but you also have a concept of functions. How many of you, you uh, uh, design only using UML? See, that's only one guy. <laughs> it's, it is all a notation. If you and I can sit down and draw a symbol, what are notations? Notations are useful to communicate, right? No, that's the wrong thing to do. Don't. Right? It is just entities abstraction. That's what it is. It's a notational thing. Notation simply helps us to communicate. That's all. If you can have a notation for functions, you can use a function to communicate. Remember, functions are, are, functions are things, just like objects are things. And do objects do things, stuff for you? Functions do stuff for you. So then you are composing your application using objects and functions in a language like Scala, in a pure function, you only use functions to compose it. So that's how you would design the application. There is the design, and there's a representation of the design, right? UML is a representation, it's not the design. But you can come up with any notations you want. So the function is like a transform. It's a map, it's a, ma it's a transformation, right? It transforms an input to output without a side effect based on a certain expectation of the internal behavior. That's it, it's a transformation. Yeah. Which don't have any uh, uh, instance variables, only functions. Can I say my code is functional? No. Because those functions can receive input and mess it up. Functions should not have side effect. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and only functions taking final. Well, the function could be final, but it no, could modify the. My, my parameters are also. Well, remember what, what it means when a parameter is final. You cannot change the reference, but the object that it points to can be changed. That's why immutability is still prime. Final simply protects the variable, not the object. So immutability is very important. If everything in your application is a string, and then your functions, you could become functional. You could tend to be towards functionality, functional programming. Um, you cannot pass the functions themselves. You can, you can, but you cannot pass the functions themselves, you're saying. Well, that's where the anonymous inner classes come in in Java, right? Yeah. So you would pass them through the interfaces. You just did. So you had a list. So it's like a paradigm shift from object-oriented programming to functional programming. Uh, object functional, both. When we actually moved from C to C++, okay, people still used to write structured programming in C++. Right. So don't you think that it will be very difficult right. for the people who are doing object-oriented programming to move to functional But that's their problem, right? Not your, not your problem and my problem. They will still tend to do object-oriented programming. In don't you agree that writing bad code is human right? Why should we stop them? No, but again, it will take uh, around five years of time for the people to just get... You are young. What's the rush? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
it's, it's, a, it's a different view of the world, right? It's a different view of the world. I, I was teaching a course, uh, I'm a faculty as well, and I'm, I was teaching a summer course. This is a five weeks course. In five weeks, my students learned five different languages. Only five students survived the course. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the semester, I asked my students what they liked with, without any bias. And the languages I used in the course are Groovy, Scala, Erlang, Closure, and one more thing I can't remember now, Ruby. So, so we use these five languages. In addition to Java, C Sharp, we never considered it because my students knew those languages fairly well. So Ruby, Groovy, Clojure, Scala, and uh, Groovy. So when we did this, uh, and Erlang, sorry. So when I finished the course, I asked the students, and I had one student with fairly good experience, 15 years experience. And then he said, I preferred Erlang over Scala. That's just his opinion. And I said, why? He said, because Erlang is purely functional. I would sit there for four hours. I don't know how to write code in it. And I would fight with it. At the end of four hours, after a lot of frustration, it worked. Whereas in Scala, I would fight for 30 minutes, don't know how to do it. I would switch over to write function, imperative style like in Java, and it let me do it. So if I really want to learn the paradigm, Erlang was easier for me to learn the paradigm, right? That's, that's a valid opinion. But look at the flip side. It's a completely alien syntax. It is very dynamic. The learning curve is steep. Whereas in the language like Groovy in Scala, you can still continue to write code like you do, but with a certain amount of awareness, you can start changing your code. So it's really a personal preference. So you could be very dogmatic and say, this is the way it will be, and you have to break it. Or you could be pragmatic and say, yeah, it's not a perfect world, but it can give you the best of both worlds, but be aware of what you do. But the way that I write a code a lot of times is, I don't write the code and I don't hide it. I write the code and ask people to review it. So I may not really get it, but the guy next to me reviews it, and that shortens the time of my learning curve. So there are other software development practices that can help a learning without going really, your questions are very good questions, but that's the way I would approach it, is more of a pragmatic way to say, yeah, we can balance it out. So there are benefits, certainly. Why? You're not throwing away your investments. You're leveraging your investments. That's the benefit you get. Yes. How do I kind of relate to I'm going to get to it. Okay. I'm hoping we'll get to it. We got about 15 minutes. We'll we'll do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the maintenance of the uh, software or project? Yes. What about it? Yes. Yeah. I think we should. <laughs> Why? How? Hmm. Why is it hard to find a bug? It's less readable. It is less readable. Uh, if you give me Canada script, it's totally unreadable. So nobody should ever read Kannada anymore. That's unreasonable, right? For a person who doesn't know the language, it's totally alien. So when you look at a language, this is a maturity process. That's why you are a kid. When you look at a language, when you program in five different languages, then you don't worry about readability because you realize that it's a different language. Once I've learned the language, I will understand. This is like you went into Punjab. And you say, wow, these people are crazy. Their script is not readable. <laughs> right? No, they've been around for centuries. They're very smart people. It's just that you need to take the time to learn their script. Then it becomes readable to you, right? That's the... Actually, we have the project in which uh, we use the Ruby to build our project. Yeah. And uh, it, sometimes it's very difficult to get uh, one of closing the program. That's great. great. It's only sometimes. The other times it's fun, right? <laughs> it's... You, it more time than the Java. No, it will. It, that, so, so if you tell me to go ride a car when I've never ridden a car, I've ne I don't know driving, and you tell me go sit in this car and drive around, I'm going to say, this is crazy. You should never drive a car because this is so hard. No, if, if I take your uh, case, you know the Java and you know the Scala and the Ruby also. 
Yes. Uh, which one you think that uh, is easier to understand and easier to debug? All of them are hard to understand. All of them are hard to debug. <laughs> because if somebody is determined to write bad code, they can write bad code in any language. You cannot say, here is a language for writing bad code, and you write good code in this language, right? I mean, that's unfair to languages. That's a fallacy. If somebody wants to write a bad code, they will write bad code in any language. Have you seen people write bad code in Java? You haven't seen my code. I can write really bad code. So no, languages don't promote bad practices. We promote bad practices. Once you know how to write good code, some languages have a better advantage over the others. But languages themselves don't make the code bad for you. Well, there was one more question, yeah. Uh, so the theory concept that you have many languages, do you have concepts of objects? Like, uh, uh, yes, they do. Like they do, they do. In fact, okay. talking about bugs, they are lesser because they promote immutability. So much bug arises because of mutability, actually. So as far as bugs, actually, they have fewer because of the reason. So it's, it's actually only better. All right, we got to get, get moving. Yes? That's the confusion, again. Right? <laughs> it's all these mistaken beliefs. Just because an object has a variable, it doesn't mean it has a state. And just because there is a state doesn't mean it's mutable. This is, you know, an onion, right? You take an onion and you peel a layer of onion. And then there's more layers to peel. And then there's more layers to peel, right? And you're peeled about two, three layers of onion. But there's a lot more layers to peel. But every time you peel onion, what happens? Hmm? You cry. That's what it is. When you peel these onion layers, you're going to cry a little bit. It's frustrating. But that's where you get deeper understanding of things. A lot of list applications are that way, but there are several others. There are Scala. Twitter was written in Scala, for example. Right? The back end of Twitter. There's several applications out there. You just need to look and, and be willing to look. Hmm? Sorry, say that again? I heard somebody say something. No, closure again is a concept, right? It's the, it's the immutability and functions with no side effect, right? All right, so what I'm going to do for the rest of the session is not question whether these are useful, right? Then we'll be talking about it, and we won't be able to see the features. So you need to just put that in a function and then evaluate it later. So this, anybody done with this? Finding the total? You can do this recursively, right? Tail recursion plus. You could do anonymous functions. Yeah, we could do that. Certainly. Combination recursion, recursion and. Uh, wait, what is the one I'm dealing with? Five. All right. So let's go get back to this. Um, Five. So what do we do here? I'm going to do this a little differently. So I got a list equals this values. So list dot, and we're going to do this a little differently, right? What we're going to do here is use a function which accepts a function, and this is already built in, so life is easier. But the way we're going to do this is, Imagine each one of you is elements in the list. So each of you have a value. And the way I'm going to compute it is, I'm going to send you a value. You're going to total the value with the value I sent. Send it to him. Now he's got the accumulated value, right? He will add it to his own value and send it down. Fair enough? 
So this is called the fold left method in Scala. So I say fold left, which takes a zero as the initial value, the value I sent to you, and this function is going to accept something. Let's assume for a minute that, that he is the element. You are given a function. How many parameters this function is going to have? Two. One that you get from the left and the one that is your cells, right? So it's going to take two parameters. The first parameter is carry over. The second one is element. And what does it return? Carry over plus element, right? It returns a carry over plus element, or the two things. And then print the total value, the, the total, right? Total. So what is the total now? That's a value we get from here. So value total equals. This equals that you see here is not an assignment. It's an initialization. You did not reassign to this total several times here, right? So if you notice here, the carry over and total are the two values that we got over here, these two guys. So list is that list. List dot fold left takes a zero. What does it do? Carry over E, return the carry over plus E, and then we're printing the total. So notice how you're sending a function to a function. You didn't really spend the time to even loop through things. Uh-huh. So that looks like you are calling fold left with one argument. Uh, two arguments. Because the second argument it doesn't have to be inside. The last argument is given a special treatment. So you could have written it like this, for example. You could have written it as comma, and then you would come all the way here, and you would close this here. But notice how ugly that is, right? Because you got to carry over and put that comma over there. But functional style people understand that you attach functions to functions. So once you get used to the style of programming, you're pretty used to it. That's the way things are in Ruby, for example. That's the way things are in uh, Groovy, for example. You just attach things to a function, and the last parameter. So that also looks like hold the left returns a function, takes one argument, returns a function, which again takes a function, and uh, It could look like that, but if you squint your eyes, it won't look like that anymore, <laughs> right? It's getting used to the syntax and the concept. When you come from something that you don't know, I mean, if you, if all these things you say, you bring somebody who is a foreigner or somebody from another state, and this guy will say, that script looks like that. Because you're just, you're just going through reactions, oh my god, that's a syntax that I'm not used to. When you're not used to a syntax, your mind falls back on what you're familiar with. That's what our human mind, mind does, right? It, it is goes for similarities. Once this becomes very similar, you would say, that looks like different now. So it's getting used to the syntax and relating to the concept. Right. Yes, carry over is getting changed inside that anonymous function. Is it? Isn't it? Is it? So you're adding and then, you, then that is getting passed. All right, all right, all right. So, so let's try this. Let's try this. Uh, you have a piece of paper. All right. Can I have it? Because this is the first line that I wrote, but I was thinking, like, how will it get, get so, so this paper has a property. I can never write on this one more, more than once. I can never write on this more than once, okay? Okay, I put zero. I put zero. I give it to you. So you total zero with seven, and you got to give it to him. What are you going to do? Oh, you can't write on it. Yeah. So how are you going to do that? How would you do that? Exactly. So carryover is given to you. You created a different variable whose value is carryover plus e, and you sent out. This guy says, oh, look, I got a new value on hand. And he then turns around. This carryover is a very different carryover. It's like, it's like you go home, and, and what does your mom say? Come on over, son, right? He goes to his home. What does his mom say? Come on over, son. The word son is the same, but that's two different person. So like the carryover is the name. Oh, Lambda Expressions gives you that. Yeah, you can do that too. But in Lambda Expressions, this copy will not get passed over here. 
It depends on what the function does, right? It is a local variable. It's a, par it's a parameter. It's a parameter to a function. If you send the parameter seven times, it's seven different variables. It's just the same name. Stack and queue has nothing to do with variable being mutable or immutable. You are storing values, but when you want to change it, you create another one. Right? You know, you're creating a new one, you're not assigning. Five, add one, six, add one, seven. Five is there, six is there, seven is there. Yeah. Right? You have new objects, you're not changing existing objects. The ones that you don't use get disposed. That's automatic garbage collection. Yes? That's why we have automatic garbage collection, right? Things you don't need go away. Things you still need stays around. It's byte code. Absolutely. And garbage collection is part of the Java virtual machine, not the Java language. Yep. Okay, I'm sorry, say that again? Driver. Can you write a device driver using Java? Yeah, then you can do, do it with this too. But this is... That's a paradigm shift, that's why. You are, you are, so somebody said there's a car, and you're asking if there's a pedal. Somebody said there's a car, you're asking, is there a, is there a you know, can I balance with a car? You're saying, what, what do I do if I fall down when I'm balancing? It's a paradigm shift, right? Unless you drive around, you're like, oh, this is a very different way to drive. <laughs> okay. Um, given a list of numbers, yes? I'm going to move on from questioning these because we will not get to what we need to get. Either we can spend time questioning functional programming, or we can learn more features. Choice is yours. We got 35 minutes and 59 seconds. Yeah. I, because there's time, is a, time is invariable. It's immutable. <laughs> right? So the choice is yours. These are well-proven things. You need to raise up. You're not going to disprove these. Right? No, we're not disproving. We're just it, it is good. But, but time is limited. We got to prioritize. Right? Do you want to learn more of this so we can apply? Or we can keep questioning the fundamentals? We have already questioned enough. Right? Okay. Um, given a list of numbers, find a min and max. Mm -hmm. Done. Just try max. Go ahead. Try. Just say something like uh, list max and the max, running max and the number itself. Yes. And then inside you write if n, you know, the max is greater than, uh, sorry, n. But you got to turn two of them now. Yeah, so just extrapolate this. So you pass both the min and the max and the number. Running max, running min, and the number, and you just uh, write an anonymous delegate or function inside that. Mm -hmm. And what will you return? A list? Yeah. yeah, something like that. Or well, fair enough. So a lot of these languages support list really well, but there are also what are called tuples. Tuples are extremely lightweight. And so you can pass around tuples as much as passing around lists. So let's try this. So this is where we're going to use a tuple in this case. So tuple is immutable. It is extremely lightweight. So let's give it a try. So I'm going to have a list, right? So I'm going to say list. So define min max. And this is going to take a list, which is an integer. Bless you. So what am I going to do here? So I'm going to simply say, I've got a min and max to work with. So we could use the four left, actually, correct, that we just wrote. So it's a successive refinement. That's what it is. So list.fold left, how do we know what the minimum value is? Integer dot max value. That's the min, right? If you want to find a min, you start with a max, comma, integer dot min value. I don't know if the syntax is right. We'll figure it out. So that's a tuple 
and he takes as parameter min max value, right? Min and max, comma, element. So what does he do with it? So he says, now that I have those two, if, so we need to create the, the, the return value, right? The minimum and maximum. If min and max, oh, this is going to be interesting how to find that. Let's try this. Min and max, you know what? I'm going to write this and refactor it. Min and max, is dot one. It's a bit of an ugly notation, but that gives you the first element in the tuple. If that, that first one is the minimum, right? So if that is, what, greater than or less than? Greater than element E, then what do we have? So I'm going to say var min equals, ah, how about this, max equals min and max. Let's make this simpler, then we'll refactor it. So if, min is less, uh, greater than e, then min equals to e. If max is less than e, then max equals e. And I want to return min and max. So let's try this. Value list equals So that should be enough, right? For Thank you. So we got the list values here. Let's see if that's going to work. So I'm going to say print. Anybody knows what it is? Yeah, it's an integer. And then I want the minimum value or maximum value, right? Is it, is it just max? Is it? It doesn't like max. Max underscore value. That's what it says. Why didn't that work? Max underscore value, right? Yes. Now he tells me. OK. So um, I wish I left it at that. This is more error. OK, five, line number five, what does it say? So I've got a, so let's see what we have done here. I, I split that value that came in, right, the min and max, into the min and max variables, right? So this can actually be, uh, that, that's the value that we got. Then I say if min is greater than e, then min is equal to e. So why doesn't he like that? Uh, type mismatch. Aha. Uh -huh. So he doesn't know what the type of this is. That's weird. He should have, oh, because I didn't, aha. Uh -huh. That's the problem. So he wants to know what the type of these variables are. Hmm. It should know it's a tuple, but how does it know it's a tuple is the question. I'm going to try to see it's an int. I don't know if he'll accept it here. The inference is hitting a limit over there. So he doesn't want me to give OK. So, mm hmm There we go. So thank you. So notice how we used a tuple here, but we are mutating here, right? We're still mutating here. If you want to avoid that mutation, it's going to be just a notch more difficult, but not impossible. How could we do that? We could use a pattern matching if you want to. You could say match on the value, and then you could say case, and then you could do it. You want to try it? Yeah? So let's try it. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, let's make this a val. So val min int and max int. So now you cannot modify it, right? Equals min and max. 
So I'm going to say min match. So I'm matching on the minimum value. So case, whatever the min value is, if min is less than e or greater than, right? Greater than e. So what do I want to do if it's greater than e? We'll come back. Here I'm going to say max dot match. K is max if max e. So now I know exactly what to return. What do we have here? So min that's given. So it should be min e. And max is less, so that should be e also. That's a weird case where this is the min and the max. That's the first element, right? That's what is going to be the first element. Then you could say, if that's not the case, if it is, then what do you do? It's going to be e still, because min is greater than e, comma max. Right? It's going to be four different combinations. This is where you could argue whether functional programming makes things a bit more complex, right? And maybe there's a way to refactor it and make it better, too. But imperative is not a bad idea as long as you are not modifying this across threads. Remember, shared mutability is bad, but mutability without sharing is not a big deal, right? So you could probably refactor in a better way, but I'm going to leave it at that for that reason, right? It doesn't improve the code given that. All right, next exercise for you. Write a function that will allow you to total values in a list of numbers based on different criteria. Um, less than something, greater than something, even numbers, odd numbers, and so on. Ah, good idea. You could use a filter and a fold left. That's a great idea. But let's assume we don't have filter. We want to write it ourselves. Right? Assume we don't have a filter. We want to write it ourselves. Let's see how to do it. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, wrong place. Um, so that's seven, right? So we want a total values, right? So notice total selected values, list of integer. The second parameter is going to be selector. So notice how the first parameter was a list. It's an object, right? Reference to an object. Selector is also an object, but this is a function value object. So what's a function? Somebody said it's a transformation, right? So it transforms an into what? That's right, Boolean. So what do we have now? So I want to say, for each of the values, so bar total equals 0, return total when we are done. And I'm going to say for element in list, if selector element is true, total plus equals element. So how would we use this? So print line, total select values. So here's my value list equals list of 1, 4, 5, 6. This is good enough. And I want to total this list. So list, comma, true. I want to total all the values. So this is going to total all the values that is given. I'm mixing notations here. There we go. So this is totaling all the values that's been given to it, right? So, but I want only even numbers. Print line, total selected values on list, even numbers. So how do I do that? E, where E is even, right? Similarly, I want only 
numbers greater than some number, list, comma, element, where e is greater than mm, 2, okay? So that should be 4, 5, and 6, which comes to 15. So we learned how to really pass, not only pass function values or closures, but how to receive them. Absolutely, you could have used filters. Let's do that. So list dot filter. Filter what? E is greater than 2. Dot sum. You're trying to find the sum of this, right? If sum is a valid function on it, let's see what, it, what we did. Ah. Sum is not a function. You could use a fold left on it if you want to, but I thought sum was a function. Maybe I was mistaken. Dot reduce carry over an E, carry over plus E. Because we want to start with a zero, right? So we could tell him to use the reduce method. Fold will take a parameter, reduce sends a zero. Or starts with the, uh, I think it's called reduce left. So without writing any real function itself, we were able to do that also, which is what you had suggested, right? So you can use a filter, and then you can go from a filter to a reduce left. That's another way to do it. So notice how you're composing functions together. One does the filtering, another does the re reducing. You could apply in other things. You can just keep pipelining it. So it's a very different way of composing your application. In this case, are we not? What is the value of proto? Ah, very good question, right? And the top one we are. But it's only internal. It, it never let it escape. Right? Mutability is OK. Shared is OK. Shared mutability is evil. Yes? In pure functional, no, immu no mutability. Scala says, I am. I'm not a fundamentalist. Yes? So, mutability is bad, but only when you let it escape. So, total never escapes. It's internal. Yeah? If you take this variable total and let multiple threads access it, it's a local variable. So, no more than one thread will ever see it. And I never passed it to another thread. I'm within this function, right? I mean, that's the, that's the philosophy of Scala is we will allow you mutability, but promise not to show it to anybody else. Yeah? Erlang says no mutability for you. So that code will become a little bit more complex to write. Yeah, I was going to ask that in the last exercise. Yes. We had a pretty complex situation to find and match. Yes. Had you not had this uh, mutability? Use, yes. This is, this is the trick. There are days I would have, OK, so I'm the guy who knows how to ride a bicycle. And driving a car is new. So it's a paradigm shift, right? So when I program an object into programming, it's so obvious to me. And there are days I would sit, literally I would spend 40 minutes scratching my head how I would do this. And then when I realized it, I was like, that's simple. But it takes the learning process. So that's where you have to sit there and say, how could we really make this work? And the chances are there's a function to do it. That's what I'm, I mean, I'm coming to. Right. If a language provides a function to achieve something, right. uh, would you call it the language capability or the language capability? Or would you call it the support libraries for the achievement sort of thing? It could be a combination of the two, right? It's a functional capability plus the language libraries. Like the sum, F sharp gives you some method. So here, that would be much shorter because I would just said dot sum. Oh, it is pure. It is just that languages have raised the bar by providing you some libraries. But you, it's like you're still functional. It's, it's like they're driving a strict shift versus an automatic transmission. You're still driving a car, but an automatic transmission you know, lets you drive less, whereas a strict shift lets you drive more, right? But you're still driving a car. So it's a level of abstraction that's being raised to you. And so you have to sometimes sit there and figure out how to really make it work, and that's where the experience comes in. 
and the practice comes in. And sometimes it's not possible to do. I, I remember somebody say this, which is pretty nice words that rings in my ears. Uh, and this is something that I tell myself quite a bit, quite often. And I don't know who said this. He said, uh, do not, so don't confuse your inability with impossibility. So a lot of times, um, I don't even know how to spell, spell impossibility. Okay, so don't confuse your inability with impossibility, right? So I don't know how to do it is very different from that's not possible, right? Because that not, that's not possible is dire. I don't know how to do it is good because I could learn how to do it or I could find somebody else who knows to do it. Sixteen more minutes. We'll get there. So, next exercise. Right, um, I'm going to pass this one. We'll come back to it if we have time. So, write a program that goes to Yahoo Weather and finds a temperature of a given city. What do you think? How many lines of code do you need? Throw a number. Two lines. Two lines. Um, I'll take your seat. Come on over here. <laughs> who, who, so we, who, who we saw? Scott Davis. So the real answer is two lines plus Scott Davis. Yes. <laughs> That's what it is, right? All right. Did I hit it? Why not? Why not save this? Okay. Let's go here. Um, so let's give it a try. I'm here in Scala. In Java, what do you do? You go open a URL. You put a try catch around it. Would you please go close the door for me, please? Thank you. Uh, then what do you do? You go open a buffer reader, loop through every line you get, a pin to the, you know, by the time you're done, it's lunchtime, right? So let's try this here. Let's take baby steps. So val URL equals Yahoo weather. I type really fast as you can see here, right? So I go to weather.yahoo.com, right? And I'm going to go get some city. I don't know what the city is. Some city, right? That could be some city. So Yahoo basically gives you this, the city address. And I'm hoping I have, yeah, I was connected to the internet a few minutes ago. Okay. So what do I do? Source dot URL, um, source equals, so we're going to go open a URL. So I'm going to say source, this is Scala, so import uh, Scala dot IO, so I got dot underscore. So I'm going to say from URL, new URL, that means I need um, import Java dot net dot underscore. So you're still using Java. Is it URL uppercase or you lowercase URL? Uppercase? All right, I'll trust that. URL. And I want to print it out. Just one step at a time, right? Um, from URL. Or maybe it's a wrong API. We'll find, we'll find out. All right. Uh, dot make string. That's your XML. Well, the UID I, I gave is Denver, which is where I live. So right there is, uh, I want to know what temperature it is in Denver right now. It would be nice to know. So we got the uh, XML, right? So I want to get the content from XML. Anybody has an idea how do you do that? How do you parse? Using what? A DOM. Dom, did you, did you hear Dom? How many of you want to use Dom parser? Nobody, see? Yeah. So this is response, right? Val response equals, and we got the response back, right? XML equals XML dot load string response. So we need import 
scala.xml. Does it feel like you're writing Java? Because you keep saying import, right? But it's just a different dialect, right? So we got the XML. Print the XML out. Yep. So now that we have the XML, I want the city, right? So print city. Uh, city. How do I know what the city is? So XML, expat query on location. So I'm asking him to give me the location from which I want city. Right? So we got the city printed. I want the temperature now. Print line, temperature, XML, condition, temp. Bless you. So that's 39 degrees Fahrenheit right now. Pretty warm. There's a variation of it, but not as cool as this. I'm, a, I'm biased here, obviously. So, sorry? Yeah, you would be driving it. You can specify the dot notation because it's very dynamic. So yes, the answer is yes. You don't need to use XPath. You can use the dynamic behavior. So that's kind of comparative. So anybody knows the temperature here? Let's see if it even used Bangalore. It would be nice to find out. Does it? It should, right? You would hope so. Is this Bangalore? Yeah, right there is the address. Let's copy it. Oops, what did I do? Sorry. Um, Bangalore. And what's the temperature, by the way? 93? Hey, isn't that weird? It's 39 over there, it's 93 over here. So change this woo ID. So I copied that, execute. That's Bangalore with 93 degrees. Easy, right? Close, close, close. OK. Move on. <coughs> now we know how to do this. Pardon me. Um, we want to go to website, give a set of stock symbols, and find which stock had the top price. You think we can do it? Let's do it. So man, how many lines of code we need? So size nine, right? OK. So first thing is I got to go to Yahoo Finance. So. So right there. So what have I done? URL, just like I did before, to finance.yahoo.com. Give a symbol and a year. IO source from URL, which is the code I wrote a few minutes ago. Rather than going to weather, we're going to the stock price. We got XML. Did I lose the uh, voice or is it OK? You hearing me? Yahoo Finance doesn't give you XML. It gives you a comma-separated value. So I'm just splitting on the value. And what is line number seven? A tuple. Line seven is just a tuple, right? So far, so good? So I got Apple, Google, IBM. Java is no more. What is the symbol for Oracle? Oracle. Thank you. 
Oracle and Microsoft. So far, so good. So we're going to go loop through and find the price, which is the top price. So what do we do? Here's an idea. Let's go. Let's see if we can do this with no mutability, right? No mutability. Immutable. So top stock equals symbols dot fold left. Top stock is empty, and the stock price is going to be 0.0. .0. Make sense? Successive refinement, initially there's no name for it. Is zero is a reasonable low price. You don't want to integer dot min value, right? <laughs> That's good. What is this going to say? It's going to say top comma symbol. Make sense? So what am I going to do here? Value symbol comma, which is a string, comma price, which is a double, equals get year and closing for the symbol and 2009. Make sense? So what do I do then? I'm going to say if top dot two is less than price, then I'm going to return, so top is less, so I'm going to return the symbol comma price, else return top itself. Yes? So if the top is less than price, that means we found a new top, so return the symbol and price, otherwise the current top is good. Print line, top stock is top stock at price dot two. Fair enough? Yes, no? And he's like, you don't have to run this. We know Google was the top price already. <laughs> How much time did this take? So n equals system dot nano time. Start equals system dot nano time. Time taken is end minus start. So we can know how much time it took. And it took 3.92 seconds. Fair enough? Now we're going to make this concurrent. Copy this to the next exercise, which is, what did I call it? I misnamed it. Okay. So let's go here to 10. Open this back up. Here's a sequential code we wrote, right? So that's our last exercise here. Improve the response time. So how are we going to do that? So here's the deal. What we're going to do here is, we're not going to create threads. We're going to create what are called actors. So what's an actor? An actor is a thread which has its own message queue. Now, you have a cell phone. I'm going to call your cell phone. And at the same time, he is going to call your cell phone. Which one of us will be able to leave a message? It better be both. Otherwise, you've got to change your provider. Right? But whom will you listen first? Just because you have two ears, you don't listen to both of them at the same time, right? So you pick and choose one at a time. Or you could say, you know what, all messages from Venkat, delete. You can filter out, right? Now you know exactly what's happening. Actors have message queue built in. You can fire messages at them. And they can sit there and pull the messages and process it. Let's put that into code. How many lines of code do I need? So let's try. So notice what I'm going to do first is... I'm going to dispatch this call. 
I'm going to go one, assume these guys are actors over here, right? I'm going to take the first actor, Apple. You're going to go find the price for Apple. Fair enough? You go find the price for Google. You. Sorry. <laughs> you got to go find the price of IBM. You, Oracle. OK? So one at a time, right? So see if symbols dot for each symbol See if this makes sense. Get year and closing for what? Symbol 2009. Make sense? But when all these guys are done, what do we do? Hey, come back and give me the message to the caller. But you don't want to call this sequentially. You want to call this in separate actors. How do you that, do that? Actor like that. Where does this come from? Import scala.actor. import actor underscore. That's like a, you know, import all the static methods. But when you're done, caller equals self. The word self is a reference to the current actor. So you're saying, send me a message when you're done. So this is a way to send the message back. What's the next thing to do? I'm going to loop through these guys. So I should, you know what? I'll be a nice guy. I'll move this up. So let's move this up to here so we can measure the time. What am I going to do here? I'm going to loop through here. I really didn't have to loop through, but I'm going to use this not to change too much code. I will not do this anymore, right? Because we already got the price. So what I will do here is I will say receive case symbol is a string and price is a double. That's the message to receive the message back. And I know exactly what to do at this time. There. Um, this one here, right? That's the symbol from here. Give me one second. So um, which line number? 24. This is sim, right? I just gave it a name sim because whatever is coming for me, so look at only this line for a second. This is a purely a variable name and a price name. This sim and price will be the one from line number 10, but coming through another thread. This is not this. This is being received from the other thread. So far so good? So Scala, sample.scala, make sure that's done correctly. He says expected, li what's line number he's complaining? 27. Line 27, I want to return a symbol and price over here. Let's understand what the problem is. Um, expected, but found comma. Uh, line number 27. Did he say 24? Got you, got you. Thank you. Appreciate that. That's a tuple, remember? That's why. So there we go. Access from the web. <laughs> why? Because I have launched that many actors, right, for each. Did we do it the right number of times? So it's stuck for some reason. So actor, and we say go get these for each one of them. And then I'm going through the symbols and receiving one at a time. So I receive it. Say we see within. Let's try that. Need to make sure we're getting, getting back as many responses as we sent out. Yeah, that was the problem. We need to ensure I didn't send out one too many. There was a timeout. Let's see why. Um, let me run the other program real quick. That was a nine, right? Scala sample. So that's working. So um, let's find out what I did wrong here. So this one, need to examine this really quickly to make sure I did not call this one too many. Unhandled timeout. So he is getting one less. Let's see why. So I send this for five calls. So for each, I have dispatched the calls for each one of them. 
for the symbol, and I've said, and then that's the problem, collar. There we go. Because I did not send it to the collar, I sent it to himself. There we go. So that's 0.99 second versus, this of course only had a few things, but let's say Scala, go to exercise 9, Scala, sample. So that took about 4 seconds, right? And I'm going to run Scala, sample. This is the concurrent one, because sending 5 actors at the same time, that is 0.9 seconds. But notice how little code we had to write to manage concurrency. Why? Because we fired up the actors, and we called the receive within, and received the value. So that's an example of using concurrency with Scala. Questions, comments, yes? No, because these are languages that run on the JVM or the CLR. That's the reason, nothing else. It's a, it's a nice migration path, right? You are able to build on something that you already have. You can see the amount of concern people had here in the CLR. Imagine coming and saying, throw away everything you have and start in a new language, in a new platform, right? So this is a nice migration path. That's the only reason, not for any other reason. What is the thing about course and all? How yeah. does it map against Java or any other oh, language? Oh, each of these threads go into a different core. Who manages that? JVM. JVM already does this, by the way. It's just that the language doesn't give you the capability enough. Java provides threads. Ja oh, but Java threads are the problem, right? Because mutability with shared state. Then you start limiting things. This doesn't, this says, I'll take care of immutability, so the communication is more concurrent. Here is Java's concurrency. He's driving on the street. What happens when you go to the uh, intersection? You wait until those guys cross over. This is like having a freeway. You go over, 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 fly over. Ex yeah, exactly. And you, you, and you prevent... Well, even there, it's across, uh, concurrent co across cores, but there you have mutable state. Anytime you have mutable state, it's a traffic light. Here you have immutability. Hey, what do I do when I want to share? Well, message pass. So an actor sends a message and says, you here, catch this data. My data is mutable, could be, but you send it to me, I'll work locally. When I'm done, I'll send you a message back. You can keep going. You are not blocking on me. There's no shared Mutable data. But if I can achieve that, the programming, uh, logic or technique or whatever, the Java also. How do you do that? Is it impossible for that? How do you do that? I'm not experienced in Java, so to say. But if no, but, but the point is that, right? Because Java fundamentally is built with mutability. Okay. It's a paradigm shift in Java to do it. It's a paradigm shift no matter where. The design principle of Java came from mutable shared state. The design principle of functional programming comes from immutable shared state. When you try to fit something that it's not, right. you, what you just said is, Venkat, I could do object-oriented programming in C. Why do I need C++, Java, and so on, right? Yes, it is possible to do OOP in C, but would you? Right? It's the same argument. Yes, it is possible to write concurrent code and do all of this in Java, but why would you? Because it's so hard yeah. to retrofit into so something. Right? To retrofit all this into something that it was not built for it, right? It was not designed for it. And it's hard to make things do what it's not designed for. It's already hard to make it do what it's designed for. It's even more <laughs> harder, yeah? Is it the same with Groovy or can I use Groovy? Well, Groovy again has Jeepers. Jeepers is a similar library. Again, I would make the argument it was not designed for it. Right? Don't get me wrong, I love Groovy, but I don't use it for this purpose. It's exactly, right? Can That's what you want to leverage it. Both. Yes, you can. Can I say, uh, Kata is a superset of Java. What Java can do, it can also do, and more. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And say, so is Groovy. Yeah. yeah. But both the intent is different. The, yeah, the flavor, the paradigm is different. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are more functional in a, in a way. So if you don't want, you don't care about JVM at all, if you're writing a greenfield project, nothing to do with Java, nothing to do with CLR, you could use those languages. And they're very powerful languages. But functionally, they also have a particular advantage over some 
Well, they're pure functional, that's all. That's what you're going to lose, right? You got the libraries of Java that you can use now. There you have to either use their own libraries or go invent one. But they're very powerful. No, don't, don't get me wrong. But it's, it's the taste you have had. Hey, I've got these things. I want to leverage off of these. Then these give you advantage. If you say, I don't care at all about JVM. I don't care about Java libraries. I have nothing to do with it. Then the advantage is that they are more powerful languages. You don't need the baggage of the JVM coming with you. The, the, the example I use it is, some, you know, people ask me, when would you use Ruby versus Groovy? Well, if I don't care about Java or JVM or deployment or libraries, I use Ruby. I love the language. It's great. But if I have to integrate with something that's Java specific, I use Groovy. I've heard that uh, Haskell is very difficult to learn. Everything is difficult. <laughs> Because it makes you think better, it makes you smarter, and you design better. It's as good as learning a new language that we speak. Yeah, natural yeah. languages, right? The guys who speak multiple natural languages think very differently. If you only know one language, how much time we have? Done? Is it a hard time to shop? Can we spend three, three four more minutes? You don't have to record it. You want to spend a few, few more minutes? Let's do this. Uh, this is completely off topic, right? Okay. So um, 